Okay. Here we go. Let's warm up to this. Before vegan was cool, you get the first comment. Well done for you. Greetings. Welcome. Salutations. It's Thursday, the 9th of July, 2020. I'm Baratunde Thurston. This is Live on Lockdown, episode 31. We've been doing this 31 times. Hello, Montre75, Dutch as hell. I like to see Brianna Jenkins. Hey, like to see my regulars and new people and D Merrill. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Per usual, um, put your questions and topics, hit the question tab to add to the pile. Thank you so much for those who already submitted things throughout the day. That makes life a lot easier. I actually may have prepared some things uh, instead of totally winging it like the president. Though, honestly, we know my winging it is better than the president's winging it. Though he could probably tear up some wings uh, that I'm sure of. Okay, so let's get current. And I'm going to try to just uh, get into it. So first up, uh, I got some music for you. This song I dedicate to the president of the United States of America. Yeah, that's the anthem. That's my official pick for election song of 2020. You about to lose your job. And let's get into why that might happen. So um, again, uh, I want to thank you all for submitting topics. This is an interactive, improvised, responsive to the people show. I treat you the way your federal government should. I see you, I hear you, I respond. So Tracy Fowler uh, brings us to our first segment tonight, Trump's financial records. Thank you, Tracy, for submitting the topic. And uh, again, you're about to lose your job. I uh, The Supreme Court ruled today on a number of matters, including that like half the state of Oklahoma is actually Native American land. They should just go ahead and expand that ruling to say the whole United States of America. Why limit it to Oklahoma? Why not just undo all the colonialism and genocide? But, you know, baby steps. We'll take it where we can get it. We being humane people. The court also ruled on these matters of transparency and executive authority and dictatorial tendencies provided by the legal team of the current president. And the case made by the president's team in the matter of revealing his financial activities and history in a lawsuit in the state of New York, uh, their case was, uh, our boy here's above the law. That's like the legal translation. We don't have a president. We have a dictator. Everybody knows we got a dictator. Let Trump be Trump. It was on the campaign wall and it's on the White House wall now. And the Supreme Court, including Brett Kavanaugh, who shouldn't be there, and Neil Gorsuch, who's sitting in Merrick Garland's seat, was like, Nah, sorry, because we're going to run it back like 200 years to the Aaron Burr days. Hamilton, we'll talk about that too. And the president is not above the law and has to respond. And it, what I found interesting, because I'm not like a Supreme Court watcher. I don't want to pretend to be. I mean, I care, but I'm no Dahlia Lithwick. <laughs> I'm no lawfare. So if you want to get deep onto that level of legal analysis, there are other places for that. But if you want some flavor with your Supreme Court breakdown, you stick right here with me. And what I found fascinating was three arguments that the court rejected uh, that Trump's lawyers made that subpoenas would distract him from his duties. That this president would be distracted 
from his that's cool i'm impressed that they put that in writing i think i think we should offer some kind of award to the president's council that they fix their faces to say that that they position their pens that they establish their fingers above a typewriter to present the idea that this president would be distracted by subpoenas it's good. It's like good. I can't even. Yeah. So Supreme Court was like, nah, we know he lives on Diet Coke and Fox and Friends. So you can't really argue that this would distract the distracted in chief. Like how much more off the ball could his eyes be than his actual presidency? So that was struck. Um, and then the, the lawyer said that these lawsuits would stigmatize the president. Yeah. There's a, there's a list of behaviors and actions and activities that could stigmatize a president. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> <clears throat> me, 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 me. House about using campaign money to pay off a porn star you were having an affair with. That could be stigmatizing to a president. Or writing a giant sharpie note to yourself for what to say when surrounded by constituents with things like be empathetic. That could be stigmatizing. What else could be stigmatizing to a president? Having no plan to govern, staffing cronies in positions of real authority, <sighs> talking about um, two Corinthians. Mm -hmm. That could be stigmatizing. If, if you're a president who relies on allegedly evangelical people for your support, you might be stigmatized by talking about Two, two Corinthians. So the court, you know, they saw through that and they dismissed that BS as well. And the third argument the court dismissed, uh, the, the lawyers for the president argued that he would be subject to harassment from elected prosecutors around the nation. I should hope so. I, I should greatly hope so because he is not subject to oversight by the separate but equal body of the United States Senate. So... Bring on the prosecutorial harassment since Mitch McConnell is blocking all reasonable oversight in his body. And ain't nobody trying to waste time with this president on flippancy. If prosecutors are bringing a case, it's a real case. If we were going to see prosecutorial indiscretion, we would have seen it by now. You think, you think there's a prosecutor out there just waiting to see what Cy Vance gets from New York? No. If they were going to do this, they would have done this by now. So I appreciate the seven to two ruling, the only holdouts were Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito, but that's like what they do. That's, that's their thing. So it doesn't, it was a unanimous ruling by sentient beings in the Supreme Court. And um, I don't know any other way to say it, except what, what could I say? I guess I... Yeah, that's what I would say. That's what I would say. Okay. That, that, um, the New York Times homepage doesn't usually bring a smile to my face because it's covered in blood of dead and dying Americans who've been sacrificed by an enfeebled federal apparatus led by a small mind. But today, I got a brief amount of joy from a late attempt to provide some accountability to the highest office in the land. The president, of course, responds, uh, persecution, blah, blah, blah. But accountability feels like persecution when your entire life you've been allowed to do whatever you want with no consequence. I don't exactly blame the guy. No one's ever stopped him before. 
why would they start now? I'd be mad too. Wait, but, but I never paid anybody for anything in my life. Why are you trying to hold me to these rules now? I stole from working people. That's my thing. I dumped my first wife and my second wife for my third wife. Why would you expect consistency from me? What is this thing on? Is this thing? He's probably very confused. I, there is a tiny part of me that has an inkling of empathy for the tiny part of the president that has humanity. And that little sliver of Venn diagrammatic overlap, I feel kind of bad for the man. Because what's happened to him today should have happened to him when he was like six years old. And it, it never, it never happened. So he'll still get away with murder, literally. Like a lot of Americans are going to die because of him. But this was a, I wanted to start with some good news. So I take that as good news. Um, there's another story that was on a homepage in the New York Times. And this show started live on lockdown. So let me return to COVID-19 and coronavirus. We have record cases of this virus running rampant in the United States. It's like we didn't even try. Um, yeah, Europe was blowing up and America was like, hold my beer. Seriously, hold it because I'm at a bar because we reopened the bars too soon. Hold my beer. I don't have masks. And so we are suffering now. The states that are hit hardest are the ones that reopened the soonest. Hello, Governor DeSantis in Florida and to my Floridians. I feel for you. I am so sorry that you've been cursed with this leadership. You had a chance to have someone better, but it didn't happen to my people in Georgia. Uh, Brian Kemp, I'm so, um, again, you could have asked, asked Stacey Abrams. They were, the opportunity was there, but it was probably stolen from you by the Secretary of State who was also running for the office in an election he was overseeing. But America's a beacon of democracy and fair election. Uh, in South Carolina and Texas, and even my state here in California, got a little too loosey-goosey. I'm seeing you, Orange County. Don't put this all on me. So there's enough to go around. And I just, when it comes to the people who've been in it, DeSantis in particular, I, um, they're trying belatedly to do something that resembles the right thing. That's not what Spike called the movie. He called it do the right thing. He didn't say belatedly do something that resembles what could have been right. If you had done it at the time, it would have been right. That's a terrible movie title. It's just called do the right thing. And these governors decided to align themselves, not with their constituents, but with their dictator. And now they're killing their constituents. Florida had record numbers of death. And you remember back when Florida was gloating? You remember when DeSantis was sealing off his borders from New York State? You remember? We don't, we're not New York City or China. Get somewhere with that. Preferably out of office and let somebody who knows how to run an apparatus do it. And don't think I haven't forgotten about how DeSantis intentionally dismantled and discredited the unemployment system, making it harder for people in a time of desperate need to get the need that they've paid into. Because people pay unemployment taxes. So when you collect unemployment, you're just getting your own money back. It is not DeSantis's money. At any rate, it got me thinking about Denzel Washington. It got me thinking about Brother Denzel because I remember this movie, Man on Fire. And there's this uh, amazingly intense scene under a bridge. And he's got this dude strapped to a car. And, you know, I'm just going to let you hear it. I'm just going to let you hear it. Here we go. Get, get, uh, one last please. wish, please. One please. last wish, yes. Last wish. I wish you had more time. <laughs> hey. Hey, hey. And that's where we're at. We, we're out of time. I wish Florida had more time. I wish Abbott in Texas had more time. Oh, wait, they did. They... That doesn't apply at all to this situation. Nobody pinned them to a car under a bridge in Mexico City trying to undo a kidnapping. No, no, they had access to the same information I did. And I'm not elected to anything. And yet I knew. Why did, why did I know? Why did I know what I know way back then? Because I paid the hell attention. 
And we as a nation had time. We had time granted to us by China, time granted to us by Italy, time granted to us by Germany. But no, no, these people thought they were smarter than math, thought they were smarter than the rate of transmission, thought they were smarter than a mindless but determined mathematically inescapable reality that is a global pandemic. And they thought they could like pray the gay away, but pray the coronavirus away instead. And it doesn't work for either. They are facts of life. They are scientific facts. And in the end, science is coming for that ass. So my sympathies to the people in the states suffering, my deep disdain for the leaders of those states who are responsible for preventable suffering. I hope those leaders suffer. Oh, speaking of suffering leaders, <laughs> I read this headline 30, 700 times. Uh, Brazil's president, Jair Bolsonaro, test positive for coronavirus with symptoms. I read that headline 700 times. 38.6 times. Just wanted to share that with you. That's a true fact. Those numbers are accurate. You can check my math to four significant figures. Okay. Let's move on. Let's see what's in the hopper. There's a lot of stuff that's been uh, discussed. So uh, suggested to discuss, I should say. Um, let's see. Okay. Mishak. Uh, in uh, the great state. Actually, all the states aren't great. I'm not just going to be like the great state. In the state of Minnesota, sometimes great, sometimes not. Uh, it says, does Hamilton deserve racial justice criticism happening now? Or is was subtext an important influencer? I think I understand this court-style shorthand. <laughs> See, because of the Supreme Court. Uh, yeah, of course, Hamilton deserves criticism. Um and I, I actually think uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda deserves some credit for not being a whiny baby about it. And yeah, if you're going to put something out there and present it as authoritative and it leaves out some important details uh, in terms of the life and times of Alexander Hamilton, then brace yourself for the criticism. And it was there um, when the play came out. It was there when the play blew up. I remember it. I put it in my newsletter a couple years ago, a fiery takedown of the musical. And for the record, I saw the musical in person and I watched half of it on Disney Plus. But I started getting tired and I was like, the mouse already has my money and I think I value sleep. So I'm gonna come back for part two. But I still think it's an incredible production. I still love the show and I love the talent that's in the show and I like the story. Also, there's some information that's not complete in there and I think Lynn, we're on first name basis, we're not, but I'm just gonna, for shorthand, like Mishak, Lynn said, well, I couldn't fit in some of the stuff about slavery and the people who ripped him for that, they did they did good. You should look up, uh, there's a satirical play called like The Haunting of Lin-Manuel Miranda that I think even Toni Morrison helped finance. Look that up. I saw it on Vice back when they had the HBO show. And I was like, oh, this is fascinating. This brother has issues with this story. And some of his issues became my issues. Uh, but I also, I, I don't think he made anyone perfect in the story. And yeah, they didn't deal with all, all the stuff. Valid criticism, that's my answer. I do not think it's uh, inappropriate or too late because they didn't have to put it on Disney Plus. You know what I'm saying? Like that got to way more people. The people who were criticizing it before were the folks who could like get to a theater and get a student rate or spend $1,000 or $500 or get a job as an usher and lay in wait in hopes that you get assigned to Hamilton. Like those are the three ways you get to see it. So it's blown up on Disney Plus and the criticism blown up with it. I think all's fair in highly profitable Broadway productions that are distributed through MouseNet. All right, uh, let's go back to the bag. And then I'm going to look at your real-time comments. I've been just focusing because I, I wanted to try to get to things that people had submitted uh, ahead of time, which, again, I haven't uh, tried as much. But I saw this question. 
from Misha Collins. And uh, I want to thank Misha again for having me on this YouTube live with Brianna Jenkins, who's in the chat. Everybody follow Brianna Jenkins. She's dope. Uh, and Daryl Davis. And Rev D, who is the greatest human I've interacted with this year outside of my relationship with my fiance. Rev D is the truth. And you should find Rev D. Go back and find the Misha, Misha Collins racial justice discussion. Some of you are probably here because of that, because I got a lot more followers after Misha put me on his supernatural <laughs> YouTube live to talk about systemic racism. CW didn't see that one coming, did they, Misha? Cool. Um, anyway, Misha asked a question that Marielle Fontaine also asked. What do we do to prevent race-based voter suppression in November? Thank you for asking that. Because... The song that I have dedicated to this election season, you are about to lose your job, won't be true if the shenaniganry uh, that the Republican Party has in store, that this White House has in store, is allowed to proceed unchecked. So I have a light explainer and then two things you can do. On the explainer front, voter suppression. So in a democracy, which we allegedly are, uh, it's Greek. Let's go back to Greece. Uh, rule by the people. That's the basic breakdown. And we take that to mean explicitly leadership selected through the ballot and voting. And as the U.S., we have for decades positioned ourselves as leaders of this exercise, this exercise, this expression of democracy. Good, clean vote, like a good, clean fight, you know, and we actually send observers overseas to monitor their elections in, in Serbia or in Kenya. And we say, hmm, I don't know. It looks a little shady here. Oh, you're making it hard for people to find ballot access. Oh, you're destroying ballots. That's not good. And so we've put ourselves in this position and people all around the world like look up, looked up to us. But increasingly, we have sought to deny people access to vote. It's from the very beginning, you know, landowning white men could vote. No women, sorry, half the population can't vote. Is that even a democracy if half the people legally can't participate? Or is that like a halfocracy, semocracy? Like what's what's the word for that? A dem democ oh demi. A demimocracy. Yeah, that's dumb. Don't ever, don't ever do that. Sometimes the riffs don't work. It's not all gold, kids. Um, but we've been on a journey to expand the legitimacy of our democracy by expanding access to the ballot. And so we, we let women vote, we extend the franchise, we let black people vote. And, but that doesn't work out so well all the time. And you know, we had the Jim Crow era, you heard of Jim Crow? He was a terrible, terrible person embodied in millions of people. And it's really not fair to call it, it's like Jim Crow makes you like, what was wrong with Jim? No, it was everybody else and a couple of Jims along and Jimbo's and James's and all versions of that name who sought to deny the constitutional right to vote to certain people. Black people. And they made it real hard and they instituted all kinds of hoops in front of that ballot. You had to pass a test. You had to recite the capitals of every state in the union. You had to pay a fee, which was not a legal fee, a poll tax. So Supreme Court comes in, Congress comes in, the Justice Department comes in and institute oversight over these states to make sure they're not pulling any shenanigans because there are certain states in a, there's a certain part of the country where this was more rampant than others. It's like, what's the opposite of North, like that kind of region or the opposite of like West, sort of like the opposite of Northwest region of the country. They were expert at denying black people access to the ballot through all sorts of shenanigans. And so the federal government had to step in like a parent and be like, stop it, stop it. Now say you're sorry, now make up and let your cousin vote. And under that pressure, we had expanded voter participation. And then John Roberts comes along in a ruling in this case, Shelby, there's a lot of details, you can Google it. Point being, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, <laughs> old white men 
uh, pulled out before the job was done. And they're like, oh, we're good here. Racism's gone. So let's just strike that requirement. We we know what we're talking about. Uh, as, as old white men who've benefited from a system of systemic racism, we totally understand when racism's over. We are definitely done with that and we don't need this oversight anymore. So they pulled the oversight out and all these states have resorted to shenanigans. And what those shenanigans look like, it's not... Um, the violent intimidation of like a burning cross in the front yard of like a black child or a grandmother. Those are old techniques. They've refined them. They've innovated much like we have with our internet. And they have said, well, what is the cloud-based sort of Amazon web services of voter suppression? And I chose Amazon on purpose. Yes, I did. We got words for them probably in another show. And the answer is, let's just reduce the number of polling sites and make it harder for certain people, black people, to vote. And we'll frustrate them. Well, we know uh, that folks don't have a lot of time because we've set up an economy where time is money and people barely make enough money to get by. So if we make it, what's a good, what's a good amount of time to have people wait to vote? Eight, eight hours. Let's, how about an eight hour line to vote? You think that could like lower the numbers? Nice job, Jimbo. That's good. You're earning that name, Mr. Crow. Sorry, Mr. Crow. So yeah, so they do that. Um, you don't have enough poll workers. You sow confusion about when the vote is and who's allowed to vote. You punish people, including church organizations for registering people to vote or mobilizing and driving people to vote. And you create... The I'm rubber, your glue, whatever you say bounces off of me and sticks to you technique for voter suppression, which is a boogeyman called voter fraud, which isn't a real thing like the boogeyman. I mean, Jim Crow's more real than the boogeyman. You know, he's putting points on the board, you know what I'm saying? Multi generational points. So you create an alternate narrative that not only is the problem not us denying people the right to vote, the real problem is there's people voting who shouldn't be. There's rampant voter fraud. So we need to institute rules, ID requirements, voter ID. And it sounds reasonable. You should, I need an ID to get on a plane. I need an ID to drink poison. This segment brought to you by Poison. But when you then look at what the Constitution says, and this is all about being constitutional because we're a democracy, ain't no ID requirements in there. When you look at the studies of fraud, there's hardly any fraud in there. I am sure there is more fraud in the recent coronavirus recovery packages than there is ever in voting patterns in this country. I am sure of that. Let's talk to Steve Mnuchin about that. Let's talk to whoever got these PPP loans. Let's talk to Disneyland. Did Disneyland get a PPP? Who, how many billionaires got PPP? That's the fraud. It's right there in our faces. Ain't nobody going to jail for that. There's nobody being required to produce ID for that. Nobody being denied their constitutional right to exercise their vote over that. But allegedly, there's a bunch of black and brown people out here voting five times. Not true. Don't believe that hype. Again, everything that I know was said in a 1980s hip hop song or a Spike Lee movie. I'm just a belated messenger. So don't believe that hype. And here we are in 2020. And we've got all these voter ID laws on the books. We have a restriction and a reduction of voting sites. And in a pandemic, a lot of people want to vote by mail. And so you got to dirty up the vote by mail. So you got to make vote. If black people want to do it, you got to make it wrong. I believe that's what we did with universal health care. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because it would hurt black people. So, so committed to the white supremacy are we that white folks are willing to deny themselves health care just to keep it away from black folk. And we're doing this stuff with the vote. And so, well, whew, if we make it too easy to vote, Republicans might lose. 
that's an interesting thing coming from the party of free markets and fair competition and merit based. <laughs> you see, you see how this works. You see how it turns out that people don't actually believe the things they say. They just say things that are easy to believe. But if you only apply your beliefs in a moment of convenience that offers you an advantage, then those are not beliefs. That's propaganda. Okay. So voter suppression is not just about the right to vote. It's about a false narrative. It's about propaganda. It is about hiding behind rhetoric, like free and fair competition, and then being so afraid of losing, so certain of your defeat that you would avoid free and fair competition. How are you going to talk about the free market and then hide and cower like a weak little coward when offered the opportunity to compete on an evil an even playing field hypocrites empty there's nothing to them there's nothing to them and that is the lesson so that's the context here's the to do we got to rock these polls we got to rock them so hard that we can overcome the voter suppression that's already in place and will not be uprooted in time for november 3rd so here's what that means go to vote.org and volunteer to be a poll worker. That's right. I, you didn't see that one coming. You thought I was going to say register to vote. I mean, yeah, register to vote. But that I'm wasting my breath if I say register to vote. You don't know to do that, then I don't. I got nothing for you. Become a poll worker. We need a million poll workers in this election. 40% of poll workers are over age 60. And I think there's a good reason for people over 60 to not put themselves in that position. I can't. Oh, right. The rampant coronavirus. Because... I wish you had more time. And we did. And we blew it. So now we need young people. We need you. You're watching this right now. I'm talking to you. Google that. Duck, duck, go that. Don't even give the data to Google. I want you to duck, duck, go that. Poll worker, volunteer, insert your state. Figure it out. Be a part of the solution. And vote.org has a bunch of good resources on that. The other thing I want you to do is go to the Movement Voter Project. The website is movement.vote. And they've got a great map, state-by-state -state map, of organizations on the ground that you can help. There's a lot, there is fraud that happens in voting season, but it is not the fraud of a false vote. It is the fraud of well-intentioned people with lots of money wasting it on BS voter mobilization campaigns rock concerts and celebrity endorsements and BS technology because somebody worked for Obama once so they know what to do for every... Nonsense. You need to support organizations like Woke Vote, Dewana Thompson down in Alabama, and whatever the Movement Voter Project tells you to do. Don't get dissuaded and don't let random people take your money. Put that money on the ground. The best people to mobilize voter turnout are people from the communities where we need the turnout. And there's a lot of well-meaning millionaires and billionaires out there wasting their money, propping up well-intentioned but super ignorant and overly connected do-gooders who don't know what they're doing. So it's a waste. To the point at this stage, with these stakes, that it borders on fraudulent. So don't throw your money away there. Movement.vote and vote.org. Movement.vote and vote.org. All right, let me take a break. Thank you for the question. And uh, let me see what's going on in the chat. All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Kanye got close to $5 million from the PPP loan program. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, I am so Pisces. Ooh. That's a good username. I didn't do my username game because I just jumped right into the to the rundown, uh, I am so Pisces says in my country, in my country, citizens are not required to register to vote. <laughs> I am so Pisces puts register in quotes. As soon as we turn 18, we have the right to vote. I don't understand why the U.S. complicates the process so much. I am so Pisces. Allow me to reintroduce myself. 
I am black people in America and they don't want us to vote or have any kind of power. So we introduce hurdles. And it's not just black people. They don't want poor people to vote. They don't want anyone who doesn't already have power to get it. And uh, I wish, tell us what your country is because I'm shopping for backup, for research purposes. <laughs> I just, I love learning about other cultures and definitely would not take the information you gave me and plug it into like a real estate site or sort of a visa application program. Do you live in New Zealand? Do you know Jacinda? Do you know, if you know, if you know Jacinda, just say what's up, you know, from just, hey, hey, Prime Minister Ardern rocking a virus and a mass shooting and an earthquake like on the same night while you hold your baby because your woman in your country decided that was a thing that was possible. So yeah, uh, thank you for the reminder of how undemocratic we are. Uh, Beanie B says Canada has absentee balloting and it goes well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Beanie B, uh, again, uh, yeah, okay. Oh, people who watch the panel, good, good, good. Okay, so I'm not going to keep going back. Oh, Moni knows we are in Florida are suffering under this fool DeSantis. Again, my sympathies are with you. So thank you for being here. You guys keep communicating. Uh, guys, gals, and people who don't go by those labels. I'm still, like, guys is just such a reflex. But I think that's probably not the most uh, inviting term. So humans, you humans, um, hang out and talk to one another. Oh, look, it's Daniel Zoller. Uh, who's got a great newsletter that you should check out, vitaminz.substack.com. Canada and Australia, I hear, are both doing a great job with mandatory quarantine for people visiting from out of the country. Yeah, I would, I mean, I would, I would love to be quarantined in a country with sense, with some Thomas Paine level common sense. Ah, <sighs> just need to breathe for a minute, getting all worked up. Okay. Let us uh, come back to you. I got a question, and I think it's actually related to this discussion. Um, let me see if I can find it. Do, 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 do. Wow, y'all, there's a lot. There's a lot of comments and questions. Thank you so much. I will not be able to get to all of them, um, but I'm going to do what I can. We have... 20 minutes, FYI. This is a question from Leah Fins, Leah Fines, 79. Do you experience the same level of racism when you travel abroad as you do in the U.S.? Excellent, real question, uh, Leah Fines. I'm going to go with Leah Fines, and I, I think that's a very creative spelling of Fines. Um, yeah, it's different. It's different. And it is not absent. I, uh, I wrote a piece on Medium three years ago about my experience in the United Kingdom. Um, now, I decided with my fiance, who's white, and her father, who's also white, because of the really white, whiteness, we did a big train journey around the UK. And uh, we went to parts that people don't normally go to who are from the US. And that was exciting often. We went to the Lake District in Windermere, and it was foggy, and wet, like London, but with fewer buildings and less good curry. And we went out to Penzance, um, and we went to Bath. And I encountered a real-life Nazi on the train approaching Bath. Formerly incarcerated fella. Nice pro-Hitler, pseudo-encoded tattoos, trying to create a scene. And, you know, I've taken a lot of trains in the U.S. That never happened on a train in the U.S. I mean, it happened like, at a pool or a gas station, but never a train, okay? So I, I uh, popped my Nazi on a train cherry overseas. Uh, I was in Spain last year. I get around. And there were these little, little ragamuffins, little, little thuglets. Um, I think they were German but they might have been British. They were not Spanish. They were people using Spain as a escape from whatever hell they lived in normally, but they brought a little slice of that hell with them. Um, 
And it's one of those things where they could have just been snot-nosed, like trifling babies, and it could have been racist. Like it's it's kind of on the line. I don't even know whether to judge it. But I had to really check my rage because they were so trying to provoke me into doing something that would have been unwise, shall we say. So yeah, though I've had some of those incidents and I have friends uh, who are black and not me and they've had experiences overseas. Um, but, as a big but, it is, uh, it is less. It is just less than in the U.S. In my experience and the experience of people I know and communicate with most often, there's no like racist free zone, but there is a... Uh, like we're in the racist red zone in America and there's like softer zones in other places in the world. And on top of that, even in Spain, you know, which has like, it's not great on race in every way. France, not great on race. Like look at how they treat migrants. But they haven't like shot themselves in the foot so much that they would deny themselves general social fabric and social contract in the form of a social safety net. They've got paid family medical leave. They got paid sick leave. They got actual universal health care. We were in Spain four years ago, something like that, in, in, the, in the Basque region of Spain, San Sebastian. And Elizabeth broke her ankle and sprained the other ankle at the same time. It was a freak accident. And it was not dramatic at the moment. But then you're like, oh, my God, your whole body's collapsed. We were in Spain, and here's what I was able to do in Spain. I rented a wheelchair for like six euros from a local shop that just does that. And then I went to a clinic with her, and they examined her, and they determined we can't do anything for her. She needs a proper x-ray at a hospital, so we're not going to charge you anything. And then they called us a cab and told the cab driver to take us to the hospital. Then we got to the hospital, and we waited in a line. Is it a line if there's just one person in front of you? I don't even know if that... Qual so we waited for five minutes and we were seen and they did the intake. And then we waited for like an hour, hour and a half. And they did the x-rays and they determined it was broken and they put the cast on and we're in this room. And I'll never... I took a picture. I'll never forget it. It's me and my woman and like the doctor and nurses, assistants and whatnot. And I was just like, oh my God, we are overseas. We did not buy a certain type of travel insurance. Like, this is it. Our lives are over. We're, we're, we're bankrupt and broke. I said, so what's, the, um, what's this going to cost? And the Spanish doctor, and I asked in Spanish. I got some decent Spanish. If any of y'all saw me on Mariana Atencio's live, you know I could rock my Spanish. We're not salsaing tonight, though. Point being, I asked, how much is this going to cost? Quanto question? <laughs> and, uh, and the dude, he did what I, he laughed in my face. He literally, he was like, cost? No, no, no. This is, this is what, why would we charge you? You are injured. It was, he thought it was like the most barbaric, uncivilized, crude. I think he was offended that I asked, that I offered him money. Like, like I tried to bribe him. He's like, no, 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 no. Your, your money is no good here. Literally, your money, like there's, we don't have a way to process your money here. Consider it a gift of the people of Spain. <laughs> it's like, I live in a shithole. <laughs> that's, that's what I thought. And I was right. So yes, there is racism overseas. And the Europeans like to be smug toward us Americans in a moment like this. Uh, but then they should remember that we learned it from watching them. <laughs> uh, uh, white people weren't here until the, you're okay, right? Yeah, the colonization, the genocide, the stealing of artifacts from all over the world. Europe did that. And so there's, there's a large degree of denialism there. So I will not paint Europe in particular as like a perfect place for a black or brown person. But at least you get healthcare. Can't say that about the greatest country in the world. So, you know, if we if we start lining up receipts, I don't know. I don't know. If you just start look at the numbers in a free and fair open market competition, which we know some people in our society are very much afraid of. Thank you for that question. 
Um, and let's see. Ooh, I, that is not a question. That is a blank. That is a blank card. Okay. Oh my goodness. We're running out of time. Uh, let's see who else I had sort of pre-selected because they took the time to hit me on my story earlier in the day. And so I wanted to get to sucks at winking. Welcome back. Thank you for being a regular. Thank you for this question. Not really in the form of a question, but this topic, Christian Cooper saying Amy Cooper suffered enough, won't cooperate with the police. For context, uh, Amy Cooper, super racist acting, privileged white lady who on Memorial Day called the cops on Christian Cooper, literally law-abiding black man in Central Park, ramble telling her to put her dog in the leash because leash because she was in the wrong and she calls the cops and lies to them and says there is an african-american man which is like her way of saying the n-word but she tried to be fancy with it uh threatening my life she lied and it's all on camera and so the district attorney uh cyrus vance his office the same office that won in the supreme court ruling today about our president uh decided the DA decided to prosecute her um, with a crime. And they sought the cooperation of Christian Cooper, the victim in this case, and he declined to cooperate because, uh, as he told the New York Times, and I quote, on the one hand, she's already paid a steep price. That's not enough of a deterrent to others. Bringing her more misery just seems like piling on. But he added he understood there was a greater principle at stake and that this should be defended. So if the DA feels the need to pursue charges, he should pursue charges, but he can do that without me. And I had the opportunity to hear a more extended conversation with Christian Cooper and his sister, Melody Cooper, who was the one to post the video on her Twitter account. And the siblings disagree. His sister's like, put that woman in jail. You know, I'm like, prosecute her to the fullest. And he's like, no, no, she lost her job. She lost her dog. Like, I don't think we need to press this any further. And I have a deep respect for his humanity and compassion in this. And I want to live in a society where we don't just throw people in a cell and lock them up and throw away the key. Like, I don't want that for black people. I, I mean, part of me wants it for white people. But to be like, I'd be real with y'all. Like, part of me is like, we need to lock up some of these white people, especially the ones who call the cops on bird watching black people. <laughs> like he was watching, he's literally a bird watcher and you like made him out to be a murderer or an attempted murderer, you lying piece of doo-doo. So yeah, she, but she, I mean, she lost her dog who she tried to murder on tape and we all saw that. And she lost her job. And in a pandemic, that is not, that is a big deal. And she lost the respect, I think, of a lot of people who know her. Like, She's famous around the world, you know, like she's a celebrity in a way that no one ever wants to be, or most people with operating fully functioning brains don't ever want to be. So that is a high price. And I think I, I don't want to live in a, in a police state, in a, in a prison colony. And that's what the United States has become, like a prison colony inside of a police state. So again, back to what I said earlier, if you only hold your beliefs when they're to your advantage, they're not really beliefs, they're just propaganda. I don't want to be a propagandist when it comes to criminal justice reform. I actually want to believe that we shouldn't just lock people up. And that I would have to extend that belief to Amy Cooper. But <laughs> I am for creative forms of punishment. And I think she should be forced, like the NFL has decided they're going to play Lift Every Voice and Sing. Uh, at the Black National Anthem at the football games, I think Amy Cooper should have to sing it, right? Like, hey, you're famous, everybody. You sing the Black National Anthem with no notes. With no, you gotta know it. And I'm talking about the full version. Like everybody knows the one verse, you gotta do all the verses. So that's that's your community service. Um, and how does, how does it feel to be our Aunt Jemima? Amy, all right, let's get creative. So that could be fun. I think we could have some fun without fully dehumanizing each other. Um, 
Because that, you know, do unto others, right? It's kind of basic and it's really hard. And there is a temptation to lean on vengeance, but I want justice. And I don't think justice is putting more people in jails and prisons. I think justice is people learning from their mistakes and being better and other people knowing that there is a cost and whether they believe better or not, behaving better. At the end of the day, your actions are what affect me in this world. So if we can't change your heart, at least change what you do with your mouth. Thank you for that. Okay, what else we got in the bag? Uh-huh. I was really excited to talk about that one. Listen, somebody wanted me to talk about Kanye. No. Okay. Uh, let's see. What else we got? This was more of an emotion type question. Um, where, existential cries, which is like a really emotional username. And I'm just sending you love, existential cries. Dealing with suppressed negative emotions as a black person in the current climate. Ooh, that is a very compassionate suggestion for discussion. Thank you. Um, and I hope I can be helpful if this is you. Or, or if not, someone in, in the commentaries. I have some techniques and a support network that have helped me deal with a lot of negative emotions. And part of my growth is learning to acknowledge my own suppressed negative emotions. I've gotten so good at playing nice and being diplomatic and using my words that it's the reflex that, that I will cut myself off from expressing the raw, true emotion in order to protect the feelings of another. In this case, like the oppressor. And in part that survival, because when the oppressor gets mad, everything, it's like a, it's a hard dance. You know, you want to like speak truth to power, but power is fragile as hell. You know what I'm saying? Like you ever tried speaking truth to power and then power throws a tantrum and then power calls the cops on you when you didn't do anything wrong and then you end up with a record. So it is a balance. And when you're unable to safely express those emotions in the moment, they get all bottled up inside and they show up as, oh, my neck's really tight and I got this spot over here and I just snap sometimes at someone I love for no good reason and uh, maybe I have too much brown liquid or, you know, people have different ways of coping that are not the healthiest. And so the healthy ways I've discovered are love. <laughs> love helps a lot. The love of uh, my lover, the love of my family, the love of friends, who know me deeply, not just like, I have some Insta friends, I love y'all, but like there's the people who've known me from my most embarrassing days in my life. And that is what I lean on in a moment like this, which is extended. It's not just a moment anymore, it's like many moments. So that's really helpful. Uh, physicality is really great. And I I walk almost every morning, many miles. Sometimes I just, I don't know when I'm coming back, <laughs> right? And I'll do like three miles, four miles, five miles. Okay, and I come home. And I'm doing more fitness. Um, and actually, this is, there's another story in this, but I'll plant the seed now. Uh, I am building my fitness regime based on Tim McGraw. That's right. His book, Grit and Grace, is a pandemic favorite next to my bed. And I just, I like, I like it. I like him. I met him once because I got to interview him for my podcast, Spit, last year, an episode on diabetes. And uh, he was great. So sweating, stretching, and meditating, and then enjoying life with good food and good music and dancing and being silly and watching media that doesn't have to do with like white people crushing other people. That's important. Uh, and finding ways to let some of that out. And crying. And just releasing it from my spirit and my body. Uh, so I don't have it all sorted out. It is a journey. I hope you uh, have that. And I hope some of what I've shared is helpful to others. And that you are talking amongst yourselves to share other tools. Because I don't know everything. I know a few things. I, mean, I know more than the president. But that's a low bar. It's a low bar. Okay. 
What else we got? Uh huh. All right, let's go to what's coming during the show. Oh, yes. Oh, Daniel Zoller. Daniel Zoller's got a question. Daniel, formerly known as the Daniel Isaiah, our pandemic dating adopted human. Daniel, we, we love you so much. We're, we're so invested in you on both versions of this show. So Daniel asks, if you were single and hashtag pandemic dating like me, would you kiss someone? And if so, after what date number? Yo, share your feelings in the comments for Daniel. I want to know what you have to say about this one. First of all, Daniel, I am excited. I love this question. I want to go back because I captured most of these, but I don't know if I've captured the comments. It's very hard to capture the comments. Instagram is always changing things. But I would love to go back and see some of Daniel's first questions. But I recall they were things like, Anybody out there interested in dating, <laughs> right? Like, and now this, this dude is like, I'm about to kiss. I'm about to snog. But when, when can I snog? <laughs> like, you know, I do that British because I travel. That's why I did that. Because I've been to the UK and I learned what snogging is. <laughs> so, um, Daniel, what, what are people saying? The no, long no from Sunits. And then a sh followed by a short no from Sunits. And then a no tongue from Sunitz. Uh, definitely not from Candice J513. Uh, have they tested negative? Just like any STD, says F, F, B, F, it's moving too fast and I'm feeling old. F, D, Barbie girl. Okay, there we go. Thank you, F, D, Barbie girl. Um, what difference will the tongue make? <laughs> oh, now we got arguments. No exchanging fluids, says Tanya Holly, sales rep. What's up, Tanya? Uh, wow, there's a lot of no's. There's a lot of no's. So hold up. I'm going to... Now, y'all have just been mouthing off, but let me look at kissing COVID-19. I'm going to medical school real quick. And the Mayo Clinic has an article, uh, Sex and Coronavirus. Now, you didn't ask about sex, but we might as well get the complete answer and just cover the roadmap, you know? Uh, all close contact within six feet or two meters with an infected person can expose you to the virus that causes uh, COVID-19. Whether you're engaged in sexual activity or not, respiratory droplets, sneezing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know what? I, I, I'm going I'm to go get tested. Get tested. We formed a pod with a couple. All four of us got tested. And so now we, we feel confident and then we keep track of um, activities that kind of break our individual quarantines and like, are you okay with that? I went to the grocery store, just disclosure. So you get tested and your partner gets tested and then you kiss like you have never kissed before. And like I told you when you asked about going to the cabin in the woods or the desert as the case may be, you stick with this person for the rest of your natural life. <laughs> so, and then you don't have to worry about it, you know, cause you're in a pod together. But you know, for fun and low pressure, just get tested and then you don't have to rely on a bunch of non-medical Instagram comments to determine what you do with your body right now. Thank you, Daniel, for asking that question. That's great. I am happy for you. And um, I'm happy that you're at the stage where that is like a question that you are asking. Um, we're, we're at that point. Already at that point. Well, I wanted to do the music thing, but the music wasn't working. So I'll do it a cappella. You about to lose your job. That's my message. That's the theme song for the presidency right now. And uh, it's dope. It's a good time. I'm Barry Tinder Thurston. This is Live on Lockdown, episode 31. I do this every Thursday. Except for next Thursday. Click on my um, profile link. I'm doing a paid comedy storytelling show on a new platform called Loop, not Zoom. So click that, get a ticket, and I'll be back here in two weeks because I decided to do another show next week. I'm going to miss y'all. Unless you come on over. Peace.